Hello, and welcome to the Computing Conversations column. This column is from the July 2012 issue of IEEE Computer and is titled, Nicholas Worth, The Art of Teaching Computer Science. There is supporting video material for this column that you can find in the IEEE Computer Society YouTube channel or in the IEEE Digital Library. I am the editor of the column and I'm Charles Severance from the University of Michigan. At some point in the 1960s and 1970s, computer scientists transitioned from focusing all their energy on building hardware at universities to purchasing commercial hardware and learning how to write software for those computers. The field center of gravity moved from the mathematics and electrical engineering to the emergent software-oriented computer science. One of the first issues in computer science was how to design easy-to-learn programming languages that produce efficient, reliable, and easy-to-maintain code. The result of the infinitely varying requirements for programming languages led to the development and use of literally thousands of distinct computer languages over the past 50 years. I recently spoke with Nicholas Worth about programming languages. You can view the full interview at www.computer.org slash computing conversations. Worth earned a PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from the University of California, Berkeley in 1962 and worked at Stanford University as an assistant professor from 1963 through 1967. In 1968, he returned to Switzerland, where officials at the University of Zurich and ETH Zurich asked him to found a computer science department. When I returned to Switzerland, I got uh, an invitation at the University of Zurich and at the ETH um, to introduce computer science as a new subject. And, of course, being uh, a software man, essentially, uh, I looked what tools were available, and that was rather a disappointment. Yes, yes, there was Algol available, which uh, convinced me through its rigor and its good structure, uh, but it had a lousy implementation. And I felt uh, using that algol could only reduce the chances of it ever being accepted. And on the other side, there was only Fortran, which I found unsuitable for teaching, not to talk about assembler language, assembler code. Worth designed a language that he felt improved on algol 60 and was also suitable for teaching. He proposed adopting his new language as algol 68. So I decided to continue my work from Stanford and uh, and implement, no, not another Algol compiler, but what later became known as Pascal. It uh, had been a member of the IFIP working group, and there were finally two proposals, one by Art van Weingarten from Amsterdam and one from me, and uh, I might say I lost out, uh, and then I decided to implement it just in spite of it all, because I needed it. I needed it for teaching. And that's how what led uh, one and a half years later to Pascal, 1969. And in 1971, I used it for the first time in an introductory programming course. In the early days of computer science, academics readily shared their innovations with each other, often shipping nine-track tapes with source code back and forth. Worth helped with efforts to port the Pascal compiler to other hardware architectures. Pascal was widely available on several different mainframe computers when the microprocessor revolution started. The real breakthrough came actually with the advent of the microcomputer. Um, Apple II, particularly also Tandy and some others. Um, and they brought out UCSD Pascal and uh, uh, Pascal implementation by B -B -B Borland, Turbo Pascal. And, and they were selling not only compilers, but an integrated system with text editor and uh, debugger for something like $50, and that really made the difference. At the time when compilers would still cost thousands of dollars for the large machines, and now of course they spread into the areas where people did not come 
loaded with bad preconceptions, you know. They started learning programming from scratch. And uh, that's how uh, computing was brought into homes and schools. Because Pascal was a structured language, it was far more suitable for building production quality software on these new microcomputers. With strong type checking and well-defined interfaces, it was superior to BASIC for anything other than the smallest applications. Because Worth distributed Pascal freely and didn't charge for a license, companies such as Borland could ship very low-cost products starting with his code. It was public good, yes. Uh, no, I had very little interaction, uh, really almost none. Yeah. The, 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 the Atlantic Ocean is too wide, or, or was too wide for close interaction, I think. And uh, we had always distributed our software for free, covering the cost of the tape. Uh, and so, of course, uh, nobody had an obligation to fall back on me. As Pascal experienced success around the world in the 1970s, Worth remained focused on building the right languages and environments that would be ideal for teaching computer science. From 1976 to 1977, he took a sabbatical at Xerox Park and started thinking about a more modular version of the Pascal language that developers could use to build larger programs. He chose to name the follow-on language Modula to highlight the language's modular aspects. From the commercial point of view, it's regrettable because if I had called Modular Pascal 2 and Oberon Pascal 3, they would have had better success. Um, yes, Modular 2 came nine years after Pascal and it was a language designed for system development, influenced also by MESA, developed at Xerox Park, where I spent the sabbatical. MESA itself based on Pascal. And the primary new feature of Modula was the module. And with it, the interface specification and in the implementation, the separate compilability of modules. Um, separate compilability with tight interface type checking. That's, of course, what was missing in Fortran. And uh, so linking different m modular modules together is as safe as just programming in one module. And that was an absolutely crucial thing. Although not naming Modula Pascal II lessened its commercial uptake, it also had the effect that Worth could continue to focus on developing technology to better teach computer science. During his sabbatical at Park, he also became interested in hardware. I was given uh, an auto computer for myself alone, under my desk. And that was, of course, an absolute change in, in the way computers were used. At home, I still had a terminal linked with a thin wire to a big machine, which was, was shared with hundreds of others. And so having my own computer with a bitmap screen, you know, able to do much more flexible text editing and fonts and graphics and all that, that was really for me a revelation. And I decided uh, that I wouldn't want to program with these old dinosaurs anymore. And I had to have one of these things too. But they were not on sale. Uh, they couldn't be bought. And uh, the only thing I could do was to decide to build one myself. And that's uh, how I diversified into hardware. Fortunately, I had been trained as an electrical engineer, and so it was a bit easier. But in the meantime, which was something like 15 years, electronics had undergone a big change, you know, from... I was still trained on vacuum tubes, and now they were the, not only the transistors, but the integrated chips. But it was really fascinating, and with, with very little money, I think I got about 50,000 francs, as a starting capital, we built a little workshop and, uh, and, and built prototypes. 
and and they were of course then tuned to modular the language modular and the compilers and the operating systems were closely connected to to the Lilith computer as it was called in 1987 Worth took a second sabbatical at Park and used the time to think about building an object-oriented version of Pascal slash Modula that he would call Oberon. I and my colleague Jörg Gutknecht had actually become convinced that the future lay particularly for teaching programming in simpler languages. And Modula, to our taste, had already been overloaded with features and facilities. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to, to clean up Obero, uh, Modula 2, and that resulted in Oberon. We added essentially only one feature, an important one though, that was type extension. And together with together uh, with type extension and together with procedure variables, which were already present in Modula, uh, you could implement the full scheme of object orientation. Just like with a Lilith computer 10 years earlier, Worth and his graduate students also built a workstation for Oberon. The series, which was designed from the ground up to support the Oberon language and the Oberon operating system. Oberon was a bitmapped windowed operating system and tools like word processors were developed on Oberon. In the 1990s, Worth turned his focus to field programmable gate arrays, FPGAs, to explore hardware design. His teams built languages to program FPGAs and made increasingly sophisticated use of the hardware devices. His interest in using FPGAs led to the project that Worth continues to work on to this day. After his retirement in 1999, Worth progressed his work with FPGAs to the point where he has a fully specified RISC CPU that can be implemented using an FPGA. His current task is to alter his Oberon operating system so that it can run on his FPGA-based RISC computer. His plan is to build a complete computer using a $100 Xilinx FPGA board. I felt that we should apply the same principles of simplicity and well-structuredness that we used in software also to hardware. And this is now possible because it is FPGAs. And so I uh, got a Xilinx development tool with an FPGA on it. I implemented a processor, I call it RISC, but it is much simpler than the ARM or the, the, the MIPS or the Spark. Really, again, concentrating on what's essential and presentable to students. The processor's very low code takes about three pages. And then, and I'm just about finishing this, I wrote an Oberon compiler for that RISC architecture, including compiler and linker and downloader. Worth jokingly says that retirement is the best form of tenure because you don't have to go to committee meetings. His current goal is to finish his FPGA-based RISC processor, release his updated Oberon environment for that processor, and revise his Oberon book to include the chapters describing the RISC processors and its hardware design. When WIF's hardware, software, and book are complete, it will hypothetically be possible to build a lab full of Oberon workstations in which as part of their evolving computer science education, students could start from writing a Hello World application in Oberon, move on to understanding the details of object-oriented programming and operating system design, and then into computer architecture and hardware design. All the while, the book that they'll be learning from will describe every layer and every abstraction of the hardware and software in front of them. Everything will be as simple, elegant, understandable, and easy to learn as it can be so that students can learn as much as possible and as quickly as possible. Nicholas Worth would have it no other way. This column is from the July 2012 issue of IEEE Computer and is titled, Nicholas Worth, The Art of Teaching Computer Science. There is supporting video material for this column that you can find in the IEEE Computer Society YouTube channel or in the IEEE Digital Library. I'm the editor of the column and I'm Charles Severance from the University of Michigan.